This talk is, uh, is the second half of my talk in the morning. Okay? Uh, after I said that, you will not be surprised uh, if I, now I tell you the conclusion uh, of this talk is uh, I don't think probability theory provide a, a proper theoretical foundation for AGI. Uh, since the full text of my paper is already online, uh, linked from the schedule, uh, I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, instead, I will, I will focus on uh, the two points raised by the two previous uh, speakers. Uh, for, for Marcus' talk, I'm going to explain why uh, my system is not an approximation of his model. Uh, for Ben, uh, I'm going to explain why I think uh, consistency cannot be assumed, even approximately. So, so first, uh, for, for uh, AIXI and NARS, actually there are a lot of things we agree with each other, which I want to quickly summarize. Okay. Uh, I think the most important thing is both me and Marcus try to find a unified theory uh, of intelligence and also t see intelligence not as defined by human, concrete human uh, brain structure or behavior, but instead by some kind of principle of rationality or uh, optimization, which actually is not, uh, I believe, shared by most of the AGI researchers. So I fully agree with what Mark. Uh, Marx just said about the, the need for uni unified theory and the elegant uh, formal model. Okay. And also a bunch of other things. Uh, beliefs are uncertain and we prefer simple uh, models over complicated ones and so on. Uh, the disagreement, I think, uh, one way to summarize it uh, is to use uh, one sentence, if we have to use one sentence, uh, the right one is uh, Marcus' sentence, uh, uh, so that he's looking for uh, optimum solution uh, or action based on the simplest world model consistent with a history of, of the system. On the other hand, my uh, summer uh, approach or uh, goal of research is to looking for optimum solution based on available knowledge and resource. Okay. Uh, so you see there are very uh, different assumptions uh, about what, what's the restriction under which uh, uh, optimization uh, are carried out. And this actually, there are a whole bunch of impl uh, implications. Actually, uh, if you compare it uh, in detail, we actually uh, assume very different environment for the system. We assume different uh, experience the, uh, the system get. Uh, we assume different uh, models for the degree uh, of beliefs, and we assume very different initial degree of belief <coughs> and how to evaluate the system's action, and we assume very different uh, resource supply situation uh, within the system. Uh, clearly, to actually uh, fully explain those differences, uh, it takes a much longer time than what I can do here. So instead of talking about all of them, I will concentrate on two points. Uh, one is uh, <coughs> Occam's razor, uh, which is a uh, cornerstone of uh, the AXI model and the related work. Okay. Uh, I actually also agree with it in a certain version. You see, we need to be very careful about this thing. Okay. Uh, at least to me, there's three different interpretations of what we call Occam's razor. Uh, the original version is uh, just simply simple hypothesis uh, a prefer, which I agree, no problem about that. Uh, the second version, which I believe is the version accepted by Solomonov and Marcus and other many other people, is actually say that simple hypotheses are preferred since or because they are more likely to be correct. To me, that's a different hypothesis. Okay. And my uh, taken is simple hypothesis are preferred since the system has insufficient resource. That's also a very different reading uh, of the, the same thing. That is why you want something uh, to be simple. Okay. So to me, I don't really say that uh, uh, Marcus' uh, hypothesis is, is wrong. I just say it's a hypothesis. You need to justify it. It's not self-evident. 
And also, I don't think we can say it's the original form of, of Occam's razor. Uh, and also in the, in the paper, I argue that in certain situations, you cannot assume simple things are more likely to be, to be correct. For a GI in general, uh, I'm not making that assumption. Okay, so that if some other model make that assumption, that's okay, but you need to list that as an assumption you're making. So that's for this point. Uh, another point uh, for resource. Uh, it's well known that uh, AIXI is based on the assumption of uh, infinite resource, and my model, NARS, is based on insufficient resource. Uh, to me, that uh, Marcus just suggests, you know, uh, you can idolize the situation by using uh, infinite resource as a golden standard, then everyone else using uh, any time algorithm to approach that as an approximation. Uh, I see it in a very different way. Uh, to me, that uh, these two assumptions actually define two completely different problems. Okay? Uh, one reason, well, there's a, there will be a long discussion about that, but one reason is a lot of human cognitive mechanisms are developed completely because of insufficiency of resource. If you assume you can do exhaustive search, a lot of things doesn't even exist or doesn't even need to exist in the first place. Okay, most of the complexity of my work come from, you know, I have to de uh, design a system which can probably survive and work reasonably well when resource is in short supply. Okay, then uh, the suggestion will be, for example, if NARS is used only limited resource, if you give it more resource, of course it will provide better answer. Well, I explained that in the morning, right? It's similar to any time algorithm. When you give it more resource, it will work better. That's for sure. But why we cannot say that uh, if you give it an infinite number of resource, amount of resource, uh, why not uh, converge to AIXI? Well, you see here I said, I don't really know. I don't really know whether NARS will converge to AIXI or not. Because frankly speaking, <coughs> I don't really care. Why? Because to me, uh, to be able to work with insufficient resource is a defining property for a system to be intelligent. If I, in some very special situation, I somehow gave the system sufficient resource, to me, the system doesn't need the intelligence anymore. Okay? In that situation, what's the behavior of the system? That's <coughs> irrelevant with respect to my design, which is all consideration is about the so-called normal situation. The normal situation is a situation where you do not have the resource to do exhaustive search. Okay? So because of that, uh, I, I basically say that uh, I think to a large extent, uh, Marcus and, and me, and we are actually working on different problems. Uh, even though the problem have a relation with each other, I, I can learn from his work uh, and so on. I don't think whether my model will convert to his model uh, really matters as a, a standard to evaluate uh, whether my model is properly designed. And then the second issue, uh, consistency of Ben raised. Actually, uh, I agree with Ben's technical conclusion. Okay? I just do not agree with his assumption. Let's see, first let me clarify uh, my position on consistency. Number one, I'm not saying consistency is bad. Consistency, of course, is desired. It's always a good thing, okay? And also, myself, it's always try to be consistent, uh, which is also true for my system, okay? NARS is always trying its best to maintain consistency to resolve, uh, resolve inconsistency and so on when it's running. Okay? And also, I agree with Ben that approximately consistent for practical purposes is usually good enough. That, that's also not an issue. And finally, I'm not taking this as an excuse for the inconsistency of my own theory. Okay, Even just because I cannot be perfectly consistent, I say consistency is a bad thing. I'm not saying any of those. What I'm saying is inconsistency is inevitable in a GI system in general. Okay? Because 
First, if you have a degree of belief, okay, what that thing measures. In my paper, I explain in detail uh, the only meaningful interpretation of probability theory in the context of AGI is some kind of logical interpretation, meaning that probability measures the, the degree of evidential support. That is, your de degree of belief based on what evidence you have. Okay. If we take that interpretation of probability theory, then I argue you cannot be always consistent. Why? Number one, new knowledge. New knowledge come to the, uh, to the system all the time, which may come from a different knowledge uh, evidential base. It's not necessarily consistent with what you already know. Actually, inconsistency in that aspect is a major driving force for learning. Okay, you learn new things. You, you see things not expected, conf conflict with your previous knowledge, and you adjust your belief system. Okay? So if new information is always perfectly consistent with what you already know, and then a lot of learning will not happen in the first place. And also, in this case, you cannot even limit the extent of inconsistent. You cannot say that, I don't know about the future, but they will be probably close to what I believe right now. You cannot even assume that. Okay? And second one is for resource. If you are really doing Bayesian conditioning, by principle, whenever you have a, new, a piece of new evidence, you should recalculate all the belief, or, or, or almost all of them or all the relevant one, which can be a huge number, even if it's not everything. I don't think any practical AGI system can afford the resource to do that calculation. Okay, I don't think any human being can afford that resource to do the calculation. That is, whenever you read a new book or you get a new piece of information, you reevaluate all of your relevant beliefs. That will never happen in any system. So because of that, each belief basically in such a system will have its own evidential base. And this, uh, beliefs based on different evidential support may have different, uh, may have different degree of belief and that inconsistency may be as large as any, uh, larger than any, say, epsilon you can assume. Okay? You cannot limit that. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion, once again, probability is good. A probability theory is good. But its application is limited. It's applicable only when the resource and the knowledge requirement are satisfied. Okay? If you have the knowledge to set up a prior probability, and if you have the resource to do basic conditioning to maintain it, then you use probability theory. And the problem is, in most of the situation, we don't. And how about approximation? Well, I don't think we can call any violation approximation. If you don't use probability theory, if the axioms cannot be satisfied, and you still use the probability theory, you can do that, but you cannot justify your conclusion anymore, unless you can give an accurate range of error or approximation rate, okay? Otherwise, you're not really following probability theory. So once again, uh, the conclusion is the one I proposed in the morning, that is, we need new models. That's all. Uh, before I ask all the speakers to come here, are there any technical questions for Faye? I'm not sure if it's a technical question, but it might be. So, hey, do you, when you say that within NARS, mm -hmm. the set of beliefs is probably approximately consistent? I mean, you, you said the inconsistency could be greater than any epsilon. Yeah. But that doesn't imply that it's not probably less than some epsilon, right? I, I don't know, and the system doesn't know. It just it cannot be guaranteed. It, that's what I'm saying. It just, uh, you know, if, this, uh, if you calculate the same 
uh, degree of belief for the same statement according to different two paths of reasoning. If you're using different evidence, the conclusion may be the exact opposite of each other. It may be, but if you analyze an existing Norris system in real life, doing a real thing uh -huh. over time and kept a record of all Well, I can clearly give you a concrete example where the conclusion one say yes, one, the other one say no, zero. Yeah, That's that doesn't, very easy to that get. Doesn't address, address the question of whether a real narcissism in real life would be probably approximately consistent. Whether well, just see this simple example. Assume you are in a certain situation where your uh, environment is manipulated by someone else. For a certain statement, uh, they first give you biased evidence which all support a certain conclusion. Then they switch to completely negative evidence, which are all uh, against that the same conclusion. Then you are going to run into an inconsistency, which can be very big. Yes, but that's a weird situation. That doesn't answer the question about uh, ordinary. That's life. actually not a rare situation. Many people. <laughs> <laughs> well, just think about this: when you uh, when you grow up in a certain culture. You move into a very different culture on a certain uh, point. Very often you, you see this kind of uh, strong confliction about what you see now and what you believe before. I don't think you can say, OK, the, the difference cannot be more than 0.5, uh, anything well, like probably that. Probably approximately correct isn't about the difference cannot be more than 0.5. It's, it's that it's most of the time, it's almost consistent. It doesn't, it doesn't rule out occasionally having wild inconsistencies? Well, you need to be accurate. Then what do you mean by most of the time and approximately and so on? I see the intuition. I know that if the inconsistency is too big, uh, the system will, will, will go crazy, OK? It will be crashed down. I fully agree. And that's actually probably the reason of some people go crazy. It's just you cannot, in logic, Assume that kind of thing will never happen to your system you know, by design. You cannot assume that. I, I don't think you can. That's why I pose the question empirically for an actual Norris system in real life. Well, if you study for, the consistency of its beliefs as it went about its ordinary life. Not, not for our ordinary life, can you assume that we never run into that situation where a new information completely challenged our belief system? Can we assume that will never happen? No, but I think that for most people who are not crazy, their beliefs about most things they encounter in life are probably approximately consistent. Oh, yeah, that, that may be true. But you, I don't think we can design AGI system based on that assumption. But even if people obey that, you don't think you could design an AI system based on that? Well, if we obey that, that basically means you, we are lucky so far. Well, I, I agree that the architecture could become wildly, like OpenCog could become wildly inconsistent if you put it in the wrong environment or tried to do yeah. it in sync. Yeah. But I don't think it would become wildly inconsistent well, in, in, the, in the appropriate ways of, of raising it. And probably, yeah, I, I see as a reality. But the, now the problem is, can you design your inference rules according to the assumption that uh, it's dealing with a belief uh, distribution which is approximately consistent? Can you assume that? I don't think how you, you can justify that decision. So that it would work well in, in, in the case where, where its life experience will let it be probably approximately consistent. And I didn't try to design it to work well in a completely insane situation. Well, I think I don't have more to add. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, yeah, you have another question? Just a question. Just, uh, uh, am I right that uh, you told more or less uh, uh, that uh, Salomon conduction is uh, wrong? What is wrong? Uh, Salomon conduction. No, I don't think it's wrong. Yeah, okay. it just, uh, I, I just say it's uh, limited to a certain situation. Oh, yeah, that, that reminds me of another technical. <laughs> <laughs> is it technical no. as the last one? Or? More, more, more technical. Okay, it's good. 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 <laughs> My question is, there are theorems that you probably know in, in statistics would, would show that if you have a bunch of models induced from, from some data, then the, and the more compact models are less likely to be overfit to the training data and to extrapolate to the testing data, right? So if, 
if you take like a million date items and induce a pattern from half of them, and there are many, many patterns at work, the smaller ones are more likely to actually hold in the other half of the data. So uh, that, yes, that I seems know. like an actual foundation for Occam's razor. But, uh, but most of those kind of proofs are based on uh, the assumption that those data uh, follow a certain maybe unknown probability distribution. If you don't, if you cannot assume that, I don't think you can prove anything. You can. You, you, don't, need to, you don't need to make a distributional assumption for, for that. Show me the proof. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, let's, uh, uh, all speakers, all six speakers, please come to the panel session. Um, and now you can fire all your philosophical questions. And of course, the, the speakers you can ask the next time the questions. Very nice comparison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you are not like yeah, I'm always saying that. Uh, this is really 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 Do you want that in your eyes the whole time? Yeah, Stephen and Ben can switch. Can I turn this off? Yeah. Yeah. We're done. Well, um, okay. How do I turn it off? Uh, Thank you. Uh, I have a question concerning Marcus's uh, presentation. I really enjoy it. Your presentation, uh, especially I love the part in which you compare induction and deduction. It looks uh, very illustrating. But as a very general question, uh, your assumption is uh, induction is very important, uh, very essential for AGI. That's right. But what about abduction? Abduction is also very essential for AGI, but you did not say anything about that. Well, Okay, um, there's a lot of things which I haven't talked about. I mean, if you look at <laughs> what intelligence, I don't think so. Is, what is usually associated with intelligence, say creativity, generalization, pattern um, recognition, there are lots of things which I have not talked about, and they, if the claim that I see is general, general intelligence, general intelligence. And then there must be emergent phenomena. Yeah. Okay, so now with abduction, it's um, induction to an explanation. Yeah. Um, so what is an explanation? In a very abstract sense, and I see it's very abstract, it's a speech act. Yeah? I do some action, namely moving my mouth and this producing sound waves which explain something. So for me, or for Ixi, abduction is no different from actually decision making or um, prediction um, it is if you train the system such that it is rewarded by talking back to you in a way that you feel that this is an explanation of something then this system will do it okay? so from this abstract perspective abduction is just prediction or action I mean if you go anything a little bit more sort of concrete you know, and you want to implement the system, then of course, I mean, like the interface um, systems like speech recognition, vision, and um, motorics, you need special purpose modules. And maybe you need a special purpose module for, for abduction. Yeah? But um, I believe that these, these modules have to be sort of well integrated, and, and a lot of parts of these modules have to be learned also with the system. And so, in principle, in theory, the system will learn to do and all the other systems. In practice, probably you have to sort of put that. Okay, yeah. My question is, uh, there is an asymmetry from the ordinary perspective between decision making and uh, abduction. For example, uh, I have the phenomena that uh, the floor of, uh, or the ground of Beijing city is wet, the phenomena to be explained. And the explanation is it rained yesterday. So that's a past tense. I need a hypothesis that happened in the past experience, current event. But decision making or prediction is always towards something uh, to be done in the future. We will use another future tense. So I think there is some asymmetry between the two. So 
so first, I mean, prediction does not necessarily have to refer to the future in a narrow sense. So for instance, say, I could try to predict whether if I dig down here, I will find um, dinosaur bones or something, right? And then I find them or not. So then I have predicted a past event that there lived dinosaurs here or not. Yeah? Um, I guess that's the only thing I have to say about it. Um, I, I, I maybe one more thing. Um, at least I am interested in systems which do something, which can interact, right? And on this level, giving me explanations or predicting past events, these are all just actions. And in this sense, it is about the future sort of and the past or and about explanations. That's not really contradictory. I also have a question to Marcus. So I like your slide where you give a, uh, like a universal AGI formula where is a maximization of the fitness like among different algorithms. But um, from practical point, it seems like uh, this won't work given limited time and resources because you need to try all different algorithms to handle a particular scenario or particular case. So do you have any thoughts or recommendations about uh, how to handle this situation in the real world? Like we have a limited time and we need somehow to pick a particular set, at least uh, not, uh, to, to, not to try all algorithms, but have just few or a couple of them to try in particular situation. What would be the practical considerations? Thank you. So we'll spend quite some time on Saturday on that. And indeed, meanwhile, so the first five years, 2000, I invented the model. And then the first five years, I just concentrated on the theory. Um, but meanwhile, um, we have constructed several and others, several approximations. And there are some more theoretically inspired approximations based on universal Levin search, which is the optimal algorithm for all kinds of problems within a multiplicative constant, which is ridiculously large. Yeah? So um, you can't use it in practice, although Jürgen Schmidt-Huber has, um, with this idea, has done some practical work. Yeah? And then there are more practical approaches where um, we approximated the mixture of all computable environments by so-called um, suffix trees. Um, there's an algorithm called context tree weighting, which is a Bayesian mixture of a double exponentially many environments which you can compute in linear time. So it's quite, I mean, on the one side it is quite limited if you look at it from an AGI perspective, but if you look at it from a compression, practical compression perspective, it's very powerful. It's comparable to currently best available compressors, and we use that for mixing over the environments. And then for the um, for the search part, for the expected max search, um, we used some ideas from uh, from Computer Go, which in 2006 had been invented by um, the um, group in Canada, um, where you do two things. The first thing, the expectation you estimate by sampling, and then at the end, you do some rollout policy to get a larger horizon. So these are some tricks we just took there, which are very generic. And with this, we are now able, um, so we have implemented the system, and we can play tic-tac-toe, um, Pac-Man, a simple form, a very simple form of poker. I mean, these are not very impressive domains, but the point is it's the same agent. So one agent, which is able to learn by itself, <laughs> without even giving the rules of the game. Just, you know, you have the usual feedback, and you give positive, negative, reader. these three and other toy matrix games, very different games from scratch, which is, I think, going in the right direction. I'm not sure if it was, if it is a technical question, so I'm now asking it Ben and Pei about consistency. Do you have any working definition of what consistency is? Because for instance, for, for AGI system or any complex system, if I think if, if, if an AGI system doesn't crash, we, we could say it is consistent, yes? Or with the best example, if you if you place your very intelligent system in alien world, it, it would become inconsistent for some time, but after some quite a long time of learning, it would 
again become consistent. So the question is, do you have a great working definition of what consistency is anything different than just not crushing? Yeah? Yeah, from the standpoint of the talk that I gave today, talking about use of probability versus other potential methods to measure plausibility, I was taking the definition of consistency from Cox's axioms and the various other axiomatic derivations of the probability theory. And there's a number of axioms there, but the, the cognitively trickiest one essentially means that if if there are multiple pathways to derive the same conclusion, each of them will lead the same truth value to get assigned to that conclusion. So kind of all, all routes to derive the thing yield, yield the same truth value. And that, that is a mathematical conception of, of consistency that has emerged from the formal study of, of probability and other uncertainty measures. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't claim that that follows, that that encapsulates the intuitive notion of consistency fully, but I think it's, it's, it's somewhere in the right vicinity, because consistency means multiple things are, are all the same, and this is like m multiple paths to get to the same goal give, give the same answer. And if, I mean, if you really want to formalize that in the concept of a real agent in a real world, I mean, you could, you, you could probably do that by looking at different, very, very similar situations. But that's, uh, that, that's the working definition from the point of view of thinking about the applicability of probability to AI, anyhow. Yeah, I'm basically using the same working definition. That is, uh, for the same statement in a system, if you try to derive a conclusion about it from different paths, whether you assign the, diff the same truth value, to it. If you always, you can guarantee you always assign the same truth value, so the same statement is consistent. Otherwise, it's not. Yeah, I, I would say if, if you were dealing with an AI system that isn't explicitly logic-based, you, you could reformulate the same thing in various ways, like the, the probability of it carrying out a certain action in a, in a certain context would, would, would be the same based on the presentation of different evidence in different orders or something. I mean, you could you, you could reorient that, you could restructure and reformulate that, that definition in a way that's purely behavioral based on the evidence the system sees and the action the system takes. If I may, that's exactly what I wanted to comment on or ask sort of, Ben, um, how relevant is consistency and how is it defined if it's not logic based? And many systems like a neural network, there's no logic in there. And do we then really need consistency? I assume you have a neural network and you know if it's in this mood it outputs this and if it's in that mood it outputs this, who cares, right? Yeah, they, I mean the problem with logic is if you have an inconsistent you can prove everything and then everything breaks down. But that is not the case if you have inconsistencies in other ways, right? Well, first of all, that, that depends on the logic, as you probably know. There's a whole field of paraconsistent logics and in the logic systems that Pei and I are using that is avoided by the control mechanism. So in either PLN or in NARS, you can have a local inconsistency that actually isn't propagated to, to, the, whole, to the whole knowledge base because of, of slightly different reasons in the two cases. But anyway, but both of our systems can tolerate local inconsistency. So the, the system could have a logical inconsistency about whether it loves its girlfriend or not without, without concluding that 2 plus 2 equals 7, just, just, just as, a, as a human could. But I think that the, the definition of inconsistency that comes from Cox's axioms and similar derivations of probability could be reformulated in terms of a system receiving input or evidence from the world in different orders and then does it, does it take the same actions with, with the same probabilities. I, I mean, there, there would be some work to be done, but I think, I think you could reformulate those in terms of the same formal agent model that, that, that's used in, in your own work on, on AXE. Okay, but you have explained now how you can make a logical inconsistent system still work here by power consistency and so on. But the, I had the reverse question sort of, um, is there any non-logical system where inconsistency, whatever that exactly means, is a problem? I think that you have to distinguish between the 
logic implicit in the system's behaviors and whatever is going on inside the system. Because if you look at the evidence observed by the system, and then the system's probability of taking certain actions, I think those have got to be consistent for the system not to be stupid. On, on the other hand, what happens inside the system's mind need not be describable in, in terms of, of logic. At least I'm not sure that it needs to be describable in terms of logic. It could be some some weird nonlinear dynamical system of a neural net or evolutionary algorithm or something totally different. But as long as it was consistent in the probabilities of its behaviors, based on the order of presentation of its evidence, you consider it consistent externally as an observed system. Uh, in for our neural networks, I would say that maybe uh, consistency can be defined in terms of convergence. For example, if the system persists in a bad behavior consistently, then maybe becomes it, it can be said to be inconsistent. Um, yeah. Well, I have a question to Marcus. Uh, you mentioned uh, about uh, free lunch theorem and uh, its uh, irrelevance uh, because it uh, is based on unrealistic uh, 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 uniformity assumptions. Uh, on the other hand, uh, such uh, methods as uh, Levin search are Pareto optimal, and uh, this optimality also uh, assumes uh, some universal assumption uh, about uh, different environments. Uh, so, uh, can you uh, say the same thing about uh, uh, Levin search as uh, you said about uh, no free lunch theorem? I'm not sure whether I understand the intention of the question. So, I, I, I mean, I, I definitely cannot say the same thing about um, Levin search, what I can say, or what others have said about the no free lunch theorem, because, I mean, the no free lunch theorem is there, right? And this does not hold for, actually, I'm not exactly sure how to phrase it in terms of Levin search, but in terms of, say, Solomonov's prior, right? I mean, there is a free lunch for Solomonov's prior. So we have a paper about that actually, um, one or two years ago, and um, so does it answer your question, or maybe your question was about how can I justify this different kind of assumption which I make with Solomonov, or uh, yes, uh, the question uh, was uh, uh, that uh, what's the real difference uh, between. Uh, an no free lunch theorem uh, because it is uh, based on uh, uniformity assumption and uh, uh, more weakly uh, some of the uh, prayers uh, are optimal also in sense of uh, uh, that uh, different environments uh, uh, can be encountered uh, but uh, uh, is it relevant uh, to practice? Well, it is definitely relevant for the question whether any systems are possible at all. If the assumptions in the no free lunch theorem were true, then the theorem would say, essentially, interpreting it, AGI is not possible. Okay? So what now, we look at the real world, and the real world is not wide noise, so the assumption is wrong. And the question is, can we replace it with something which is more realistic, but still not biased towards very particular situations? And that is what Occam's razor gives us. It is a bias towards simplicity. And a bias towards simplicity is not a bias towards any particularly interesting problem. Yes, it is a bias towards problems which are generically interesting, no, not to specific problems. And that is what Solomonov prior does. And um, there is a nice relation between the uniformity assumption and Solomonov's distribution. So if you take a uniform prior on the input table on a universal Turing machine, and you look, ask what distribution you get on the output tape, then you get Solomonov's distribution. So you can say Solomonov's assumption is that someone, say God, has created uniform random noise, but then he piped it through a universal Turing machine to make something interesting out of it. And we live in such a universe, or one of these universes, and that's the reason why induction via Solomonov works. 
And yes, okay, I mean, is it practically relevant? Yes, Solomonov is computable, we have to approximate that. But we do that all the time. Look, we have data compressors. The CTW is a practical data compressor, yeah, or related ones. And they work quite well for essentially all files you have on your system, except those which you specially designed, namely pure write random noise, which cannot be compressed. Yeah. So uh, this idea works for essentially all files, although we know that on a uniformity assumption, um, most files cannot be compressed. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, can, can you continue your question as a was, please? Ah. We just, would just ah, like to ask one final question, <laughs> and then we'll close the session because it's getting late. Thank you. It so, um, my question goes to Slim, Stephen, and Sergey. And since we're on this whole issue right now of levels of consistency, um, I'd like you three also to uh, address these issues, how this, how um, uh, your thoughts and how your systems might handle or not. Um, this, these different levels of uh, consistency. Yeah, I would add uh, either consistency or approximate consistency. Right. Hopefully approximate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my understanding of uh, inconsistency is more close to uh, what he said about paraconsistent uh, logic. Uh, I think that consistency um, uh, depends on, on the language that you use. For instance, in propositional logic, it's very clear. It's the absence of the models. If you have information, so if you have absence of models, then uh, in probability, it means you know, the, the distribution is not normalized uh, if you have uh, information. Uh, now, the way, the way we deal with inconsistencies, to, at least in the presentation, is to weaken the information. Uh, and, uh, our aim is to restore consistency, to recover consistency. In this case, we try to weaken. Uh, if you have two information that are contradictory, uh, and the one way to do it is to try to weaken each uh, each sources uh, and take into account also plausibility uh, relation to. Uh, basically, if you have a set of inconsistent set of un uh, consistent information, uh, there are different ways to, to restore consistency. One way is to weaken by forgetting variables, for instance. Other way is to select a subset of maximal consistent information and to consider all of them that are different strategies. Do you have to um, be completely consistent in the limit, uh, say, as in Marcus, or is probably approximately consistent, uh, consistent enough? Yeah. Uh, um, I, uh, for, why, for, for what I understand from, from his talk, it's more a matter of how can I redefine, it's more in the system, I think, and not about the information. This is, uh, this is my, uh, my feeling. And in, in my case, um, I think uh, consistency is quite classical. I, I tend to view all pieces of information as um, constraints in a particular world. Um, so, so if you say X, No, yeah, uh, it's just, yeah. do it yeah. sideways, that's it. Okay. Um, so if you say X is similar to Y, that, that's a constraint on the type of models that you can have. Uh, if you say uh, typically objects satisfy X, satisfy Y, that's not a constraint. Um, so um, typically these constraints will be inconsistent and, and restoring consistency would amount to relaxing some of these constraints uh, in, in one way or another. So, so standards of consistency like in a uh, constraint satisfaction. Yeah, but uh, uh, our work was about uh, MDP environment, so it's not so connected. <laughs> consistent, consistent. So uh, I guess it's also about the convergence of the values. Yeah, but, um, I mean, what do you mean? <laughs> convergence? Uh, uh, are the key values of the algorithm for the... Uh, yes, yes, but what do you mean? Okay, uh, I don't... <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> um, any last comment by one of the participants? No? Okay, so uh, thank you very much everyone. Let's thank the speaker again.